Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcoming Chicana lesbian writer and musician Naomi Little Bear Morena to Washington State University. My name is Chelsea. I'm an instructor in the English department at WSU Vancouver, and I'm a co-organizer of the Visiting Writers Series with Julian Ankeny and Cameron McGill, uh, which is a collaboration of the Pullman and Vancouver campuses. I want to thank WSU Vancouver's College of Arts and Sciences and the Council for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, the WSU Pullman Native Programs, the English Department, Academic Outreach and Innovation, as well as the Honors College, the Common Reading Series, ASWSU, and Land Escapes, the Campus Literary Journal. This series would not be possible without our tech team, Rob Baker, thank you so much for always helping, and of course all of you in the audience, so thank you for joining us. Before I pass off to Desiree Helligers to introduce our guest speaker, we'd love to see you put in the chat where you're all from. Naomi and I are coming to you from the land of the Cowlitz Indian tribe. I expect that a theme of tonight's talk will highlight the many ways history has refused to be buried and silenced, and we are grateful to the Cowlitz people for caring for this land and testifying to historical accuracy against all odds. Our series this spring is dedicated to bringing Native artists, activists, and scholars from around the region to honor and learn from their work and to help facilitate the changes we hope to see. Naomi's reading this evening speaks powerfully to our common reading book this year, Tales of Two Americas, Stories of Inequality in a Divided Nation. Her experiences growing up in the barrio in particular uncovers the racism and power dynamics that divide us, while her writing and music testify to the resilience of the human spirit. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. Please use the YouTube chat to engage and respond throughout the talk, and we'll also have a Q&A after Naomi's reading where you can ask all of your questions. Our final event hosted by the Visiting Writer Series is on Wednesday, March 27th with Inez Hernandez of Villa. You won't want to miss it. And finally, if you're here for the common reading event, we'll put the Qualtrics link in the chat toward the end of the reading, so be sure to watch out for it. I will now pass off to Professor Desiree Helligers to introduce our guest speaker. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. Um, so I guess one issue that we didn't talk about is the possibility that I'd have an unstable internet. So if it looks like that, somebody give me a shout out and I'll shut down my video so you can hear me. So thank you, Chelsea. I'm really honored to be able to introduce Naomi. I met Naomi by chance when my spouse and I had the random good fortune to sit down next to her at a neighborhood pub and we struck up a conversation. Conversation with Naomi, I've learned, is very much like peeling an onion. A little ways into the conversation, I learned that she had written and recorded a movement song called Can't Kill the Spirit, and pretty soon she was agreeing to let me interview her for KBOO Radio. It was only in the course of researching that segment that I began to get a sense of how iconic and international Can't Kill the Spirit was and is. The song has been sung at protests and political actions from England to Central America, where the US was busy in the 1980s propping up oligarchs who used death squads to repress workers struggling for living wages. In England in the 1980s, the Grenham Commons Women's Peace Camp adopted the song to protest the storage of nuclear missiles at the site. The Women's Peace Camp lasted nearly two decades and brought together tens of thousands of women who took heart and courage from Naomi's song just as avalanche survivors did on Mount Rainier in 1978 when they sang Can't Kill the Spirit while they waited to be rescued. In 2020, Naomi re-recorded Can't Kill the Spirit in a video that features jazz, gospel, R&B singer Marilyn Keller. Do check out the video and while you're there, check out Chelsea Ratzlaff's 2021 interview with Naomi about her song, to a, about Song to a Dying Star, about keeping hope in the face of the climate crisis. And did I mention that Naomi wrote a rock opera? I'm pretty sure that if I reviewed all of her accomplishments, we'd be here all day. I can't quite remember at what point I managed to glean that Naomi Morena was the Naomi Little Bear, whose writing was featured in the groundbreaking third wave feminist anthology, This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color. But I'm pretty sure that Naomi never mentioned it to me. A couple of years ago, when I was doing research on Moraga, on Sheree Moraga, co-editor of this bridge, I happened to stumble across a reference to Naomi in Moraga's essay, Tierra Sagrada, The Roots of a Revolution. And here's what Moraga wrote. Lesbian, Chicana lesbian identified writers such as Anna Castillo, Gloria Anzaldúa, and Naomi Little Bear Morena were among the first to articulate a Chicana feminism, which included a radical woman-centered critique of sexism and sexuality from which both lesbian and heterosexual women benefited. Please join me in thanking and in welcoming the ever surprising, ever creative, 
ever brave and groundbreaking Naomi Little Bear Morena. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining. I'm going to give a shout out to my cousin, Veronica. Hopefully, she's watching. Better be watching, girl. <laughs> anyway, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share my experiences that I have um, translated into music and into the written word. It's um, been a um, survival technique for me uh, to understand uh, so much of the chaos and so much of the the absolute weirdness that comes from growing up in the 1950s. Um, I, I, you know, speaking of the 1950s, I was at Fred Meyer's today and I saw a bag of heirloom uh, naval oranges, called heirloom naval oranges. Back in my day, we just called them oranges. So uh, by that reckoning, I, I guess I'm an heirloom myself at 71 and a half years old. Um, I hope that my writing can speak to voices otherwise not heard amid the whitewash. I hope it reaches the corners where people exist invisibly, cornered and stamped by the vestiges of colonialism, where presently only stereotypes and negative mythologies exist. How do you motivate yourself to believe the truth, that your truth has value for others and to put those truths into words that reveal your personal revelations fearlessly if all you have known is a muted version of yourself. Consider those timeless mythologies of Mexicans past and present. One needs to address that one needs to address just to be allowed a seat at the table. When the most challenging questions that you are asked is what is your favorite Mexican restaurant? And do you know Maria? When we tell the truth, why is it controversial? Could it be because in the book of white truths, our stories have been written to accommodate and comfort those whose purposes is to keep us in our place? We talk about having purposeful lives and how important it is to reach one's potential. How does one express potential if they're buried in the obligation to merely survive? How do you tell a story that whose power when those in power do not want it to be heard, and by those in power, well, we know who we're talking about. You just do it. You challenge the untruths about your race by taking the risk to face those false assertions and stop trying to appease and please and entertain via wish fulfillment. That's when they want you to bring in the mariachis and the tacos and the gritos and the demure woman who won't rattle her cage. I want to shine a light on the poor and dispossessed because the rigidity of racism, classism has been silenced, has silenced the participation in setting records straight. And what better to do this as books about race are being banned today. That in itself should motivate every would-be writer to take a deep long look into the secrets we keep to ourselves. Those family members who have conjured shame and derision. What are the roots of that shame? In the rush to blend, we hide truths. We live half lives. All well and good if you're able to blend by tossing yourself into the melting pot where suddenly your truths get mixed up with the myths that we have internalized, even when we know that's not, that's not all. <laughs> it can take decades to realize that there is more to me than what has been said about me. The first story I'm going to read um, is about a little store that we used to go to in the barrio uh, called La India. And believe it or not, the India is still there. It's now a motorcycle club, but it was a place that was very near and dear to 
me and my cousins, we hung out there a lot and um, um, the store owner was so cognizant of our poverty that he would let us trade comic books instead of buying new ones. We would just return the ones we had and it just was a continuous back and forth. And that kind of sensitivity and kindness was pretty amazing. So I, I wanted to honor uh, Armando, who owned the store, in this story that I wrote called La India. Saturday morning and San Fernando is still dreaming. What senses the nights has seized and gripped in the lustful frenzy of the vida loca, the morning now retrieves as casually as a white man fetching his morning paper. This is a time when all sleeping faces look innocent, even the ones in jail. Time once again restores order, perspective, and purpose. Only hours before the cruisers had floated down Brand Boulevard in the timeless haze of marijuana till the streets gave way, exhausted from the monotonous pacings. Now all that remains to mark the ritual processions are the offerings of beer and wine bottles. What possibilities a night can bring have been all put to rest. They've been drained by the tireless youth and the bite and by the late night eyes of anxious parents, the worriers, peering through curtain windows, speculating on disaster. This is because anticipations run high on Friday night and the tension it creates is inescapable. On this particular morning, unlike some, many were disgraced, some were deceived, others made drunken confessions, but gracias a Dios, no one was killed. Nearly everyone sleeps peacefully, satisfied. Mando hates Friday nights. Standing in front of the big metal sliding door in front of his store on the Saturday morning, he is stumbling through his pocket for keys. Once the, roll, once the door is rolled back, he takes a reluctant glance around the corner. Chingalo, he murders, murders, mutters. Just as he feared, on the side of the store that faces Mott Street is a three-dimensional cross planted atop a bleeding, dagger, a, a bleeding heart pierced with a dagger in cherry red spray paint. Overhead in shaded balloon letters is the word Rifa and below, below the heart, 13. He purses his lips impatiently and with a swivel of his short lean body, he scans the street with narrow eyes, hopelessly searching for a culprit. Nothing but crows on telephone poles, taking turns swooping down on a splatter of vomit. Half a block up in the doorway of Saravia's Cantina, a crumbled wino moans in his sleep. Angrily, Mando slips the noose of his apron around his neck and wraps the ties behind his back muttering curses in English and Spanish. Of course, Mando didn't plan on his little tienda becoming a hangout for the local pachucos. Even the word leaves a sour taste in his mouth. Owning a store was a responsible and honest way to make a living. It didn't make him a vendido, God forbid. As the story goes, he came from a long line of storekeepers and his stores always did good business even when the ugly old Safeway downtown would advertise its half-off coupons for milk. The hours spent painting and repainting the walls of the India, trying once and for all to remove the gang's placa, was in perspective a small price to pay for survival. Somewhere in the India's history, it had become the Vatos pissing post and new graffiti appeared overnight like mushrooms after a rain. San Fer con Safos, Vato Loco. He especially hated seeing the nicknames. Sad Eyes, Chango, Chuchi, Puppet. What a waste of a good education. Expecting that most would not get at least through junior high, unlike their parents. 
he knew these kids when they were little, when they'd come in and read through the funny books and cash in their bottles for penny candy. Once they reached their teens, he remembers telling them, Mijo, how do you expect to get a job when you spend all your time holding onto your cojones in front of my store? Knowing their parents, he made a concerted effort to call them by their given names, not their street names. The gratitude returned for treating them like young men instead of symbols of some idiosyncratic aspect of their appearance or behavior was to tell their younger brothers and sister never to shoplift from Mando, not even penny candy. They believed that would hurt Mando. The graffiti, well, that was different. The boys from the neighboring towns of Pacoima and Silmar needed to know who the India belonged to. All this time while Mondo thought it was a damn stupid, it was just damn stupid low class behavior to the neighbor boys marking the India was a statement of their power. So in turn, the India herself was power. Stepping outside to sweep the walk, Mondo stands briefly, hands on his hips and takes a quick survey of his store. He is making visual measurements for a space for a new display. Though La Lomita Bakery is only a few blocks away, he's decided to carry an assortment of rolls and sweetbreads. Last week he found a glass case at the Goodwill and it seemed the perfect size for displaying pan dulce. All it would need was something to prop up the case. Rough wooden shells on concrete floors supported all the tin goods in Mando's store. Giant cans of menudo, Las Palmas enchilada sauce, jars of mole, pico pica, the pato chili sauce, hominy, a lot of foods directly from Mexico. Bags of corn husks lean against the tall votive candles of St. Joseph and La Virgen de Guadalupe. Only when you see the cans of Dutch cleanser and spam and the cartons of jello do you notice the American food. In the cooler, Harita soda stands side by side with RC Cola, a cozy arrangement of the old and new worlds equally gathering dust in sparsely lit warehouse. The sweet bread, Mando decided, will be placed so it would be the first thing seen coming into the store. The case would be put in front of the center aisle, which would be highlighted by the sun in the morning. Mando picks up the wire stand holding all the packets of dried goods, such as cashews, sunflower seeds, saladitos, pachuco foods, he calls them, and arranges them in front of jars of pickled vegetables. After school, the young men usually saunter in and pull packets of pistachios and poly seeds off the rack. Then they step around the corner to lean against their placa or squat down carefully on their haunches, sucking on salted prunes and spitting out shells. The wall is a good prop for poor self-esteem, though you wouldn't know it as sharp as these young men dressed, immaculately pressed khakis that hung razor sharp over spit-shined leather shoes snowy white t-shirts peeking out from plaid wool Pendletons. Two boys would attract a third, a three, a fourth, and so on until the hands in their pockets unclench and laughter becomes real, not forced. The reality of the reliability of the wall, their store, the brotherhood of style, once again multiplies itself to something greater than the sum of their parts. In the late afternoon, as the late afternoon passes, the walk will overflow with jokes and teasing. No more taciturn reserve and close-lipped nods at passing cars. Twilight will work its magic. Kids like copper pennies will fling themselves in a race from corner to corner for a last minute pound of ground beef. Solemn, solemn viejitas will walk arm in arm their sturdy penitente bodies with shoulders draped in lacy black shawls, all giving testimony to the place where the raza began, began, the place where there was no shame in being Mexican. The truth of this, the land before shame, spans out in the wake of their powerful passing. 
measuring the space with his hand. By now, Mondo has forgotten his initial anger about the walls. He will wait till this fall to reprint paint when the kids are back in school. It's still too early for customers, which on Saturday mornings are usually kids sent to fetch a few papas and chorizo for breakfast or menudo for hangovers. Opening La, La, La Opinion, he turns to a full page advertisement for the grand opening of a new supermarket. Hmm, that's over where they're building the freeway. The ad included clip and save coupons for half gallons of ice cream and pounds of butter for 50 cents. He reads with critical distance, distance pretending not to worry. They'll never make it. After all, hadn't he recently spoken with Don Martin and Don Carlos on how La Perla, his last competitor, didn't even last a year? And besides, if it's like the Safeway downtown where the gringos go, they don't even carry Mexican products and the tortillas taste like paper plates. It's true, for the staples and necessities of everyday life, La India could be counted upon for stacks of fresh tortillas wrapped on order in butcher paper. Here you could buy tripa for menudo, queso fresco, dozens of hot sauces, and soon pan dulce. There wasn't the suspicious grocery clerks who always looked at you as you were coming in to steal something. They talked to you like you're stupid, Mondo remembered. He was second generation Californian and spoke perfectly good English. Letting go of the paper, he got back to the task of rearranging. It'll be a cold day in hell before Safeway and that damn thrifty mark will carry chicharrones, much less cabeza de chiva. It bothers him to have lost his composure, and he watches and watched his feigned indifference rise to anger. His eyes rest on the piñatas hanging in the rafters. There's an assortment of donkeys, toritos, and parrots in red, green, and white tatters of paper mache. My mama wants 20 cents of mince ham, a pack of Marlboros, and a pack of chile hueritos. Here's a note for the cigarettes. The cell has been broken by a barefoot child. Mondo dutifully fills the order. And I want a chicken bone. Heck, Mondo takes out a square of wax paper and delicately picks out a hueso. That's a long, hard candy flavored with brown sugar and anise. You shouldn't eat candy before breakfast. Are you sure your mama wants you to have it? It's for later. My mama says to put it on credit. He writes down the figures in a dog-eared ledger. Okay, he says softly. Say hello to your tío and your mama and tell them I'm going to be carrying pan dulces starting next Saturday. Scooping up the remnants of Saturday's paper, he lines the new cabinet with a display page for the new thrifty mark. And we got credit, he whispers firmly. Nothing else will disturb his quiet pride on this morning when no one has been killed. The Barrio in San Fernando is one of the oldest towns, if not the oldest settled town in the valley um, uh, by uh, the Spaniards, of course. They came in, they built a mission there. But you don't really hear that much about um, the fact that there was a small enclave of immigrants that would come there uh, because they knew this was a place that in many ways looked exactly like Mexico. Um, my grandmother was someone who would um, help a lot of the immigrant families that would come in by letting them know where to work and, or who to contact, who to, who to talk to. She was just um, somebody who was very kind and compassionate and cared a lot about the, the people that were coming freshly from Mexico, scared, worried, with their belongings on their backs. Um, for the first 13 years of my life, 
I lived in this town and um, uh, it has uh, some of the best memories and some of the saddest memories and it I wanted to write about my hometown because I know that out there are other maybe little Chicanitas that grew up in in the invisibility of of our race which in my time put girls way back uh, not only not heard but also not seen and certainly not to present themselves in any way that defies the mythologies that we all grew up with, uh, the stereotypes, that we didn't want to believe it, but nonetheless, it was something that we internalized um, and, um, and that sticks to you like glue in some ways and comes out at times when you don't even realize it. The next story that I'm going to read is called um, Tomboy. And it's not, it's in writing a lot of these stories, there were so many places I could go to talk about everything that was going on uh, from the drug addiction, from the gangs, and the issues that were, that our family, that my family was struggling with to just try to. Uh, gain any kind of respectability and to have any stability in their lives. So um, being seen, kids in our, uh, the cousins, we always say about how we really raised ourselves because the parents were either working or not present. Um, so that means we kind of ended up being a little bit roughneck in, in some regards, definitely rough around the edges. Um, and uh, while this isn't exactly my coming out story, it certainly is something that um, made me wonder what was going on, who, what made me different. And when you don't have anyone around you to talk about those things, it, it just comes, it just, it just stays inside. So um, any would-be writers out there, uh, I want to encourage you to look at those uh, secrets, those uh, things that you keep hidden from yourselves or your families, either because of whatever traditional roles are within that family that prohibit you from truly expressing who you are. Uh, for me, uh, music, uh, inspired me uh, tremendously. Uh, I loved, absolutely loved music. I wanted to be a singer like uh, Lola Beltran and wear the whole traje and sing with a guitar. Uh, so, um, but I was also, um, as part of survival, I was also drawn to writing and one of my uh, biggest inspirations inspiration for writing didn't, didn't actually come until I was in my uh, early 20s and uh, that was uh, when I read Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. It, I could really relate to the character in that story uh, for wishing they were someone else and wishing that they could see through other eyes and, uh, and sort of magical thinking. So I owe so much respect for writers like uh, Toni Morrison, who is being banned uh, in this country, for giving a view of a reality that a huge part of America just doesn't want to look at, doesn't want to recognize, regardless of our contributions to this country. The other writer that really inspired me too as far as showing that there is another language that you can speak that isn't just about your oppressions, but it's a language of, of your reality. And that was uh, Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. That was an incredibly moving uh, book also that, that 
in, in a way, these people um, really gave me the courage to realize that I had something to say as well. Anyway, this is called Tomboy. I was sitting on a chair with a towel around my shoulders, crying miserably as if my world were ending. Great hunks of my hair floated down to the floor where it gathered in messy black piles. Around me, the unusually, the usually, unusually, yeah, I think it's unusually because I'm talking about my sister Nancy in here. <laughs> she wasn't that tender. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they, uh, they were interjecting their assurances as I was getting my hair cut. Oh, it's going to look so cute. The bubble is the latest style. All the girls in junior high school are wearing bubbles. Don't you want to look like them? And this was the clincher. Now that you're getting older, you need to start looking more like a young lady. That was my mother's line. She was the one hacking away at my waist-long hair while I was crying inconsolably. The obvious question in my mind was, but why? Why indeed? So what if I was getting older? What did that have to do with the way I look? Or worse, the way I acted? What they meant was that it was time I hung up my holster and stopped throwing myself in the dirt in order to evade bombs and grenades. I love playing army. And, I, and that somehow I needed to suddenly start acting like a girl. I guess I should have been grateful that I got away with being a boy for as long as I did, but if nobody had said anything for 11 years, why was it suddenly so important? I wouldn't have noticed it if it hadn't been brought to my attention. My brother-in-law once commented on a Christmas gift that I'd gotten of a plastic rifle and a rifleman kerchief. What are you, a boy? That there was a kind of disgusted tone in his voice, which I returned with an icy glare. No one had ever spoken to me like that. At least nobody that wasn't my same age. Of course, there was Jeannie who dared to tell my entire fifth grade class that I sprained my ankle while playing army. I chased her all around the schoolyard for unveiling my private identity. But nevertheless, it just became a sore spot and made going to school a little bit harder for a couple of days. I didn't know why it was dangerous to be found out a tomboy. Perhaps somewhere I knew I was breaking some kind of law that everyone but me felt they had to obey. The day I got my hair cut was the worst day of my life by my way of thinking. The damage was irreparable. Worst of all, it appeared that those people that I trusted, like my big sister and my cousin Mini, who was my madrina for my first Holy Communion, had colluded with this obvious conspiracy to change me into a girl. Getting my hair cut, as far as I was concerned, was the beginning of the end. It was like getting my wings clipped. All this talk about acting like a young lady was like saying, sorry, fun's over. Time to start acting like all those, adult, all those older girls that I'd seen who looked positively sedated by adolescence. No one realized that I was trained at an early age to be spirited. And yes, it was also probably my nature. Grandpa, especially nurtured my urge to blossom in whatever wild direction my heart desired. If one day I wanted to be a carpenter, he'd ask me to help him to mend the stairs. When I wanted to be a shoeshine boy, he paid me to practice on his shoes. And when I tried out for local football, he didn't even say a word. He never thought to dampen my energy with the constrictive judgments and biases assigned to my gender. And this freedom of being was wonderfully expansive. The thought of having to suddenly narrow my vision was like somebody asking me to sacrifice all of the best qualities of my girlhood to be only a tenth of my former self. 
and worse, to pretend to be somebody that I wasn't. Jeannie and Sandy apparently had no trouble jumping across the gap between childhood and early adolescence into a world marked by moderated female behavior. I, on the other hand, continued to hedge and delay as long as possible while I figured out how on earth would I manage to make such a great leap. Even when Linda advised me on how to look tough, I knew in my heart it was only a disguise. I hadn't really given up my former self. It helped that there were other girls lurking about in the shadows, also playing for time. You could tell which ones we were. Sure, we all got the bubble hatchet job over the summer, but instead of it getting our hair being pumped up like a flat tire and then shellacking it with hairspray until it glistened, our shorn heads fell in happy disarray as our proud natures would have intended. We were called ugly, unpopular, spaz, or queer, or homely, awkward, plain, immature. If we had not been the subject of derision or so wearily pitied for not having boyfriends, we probably wouldn't have needed, we probably wouldn't have known why we needed to feel so bad. The thing nobody realized was the courage it took to be ourselves in an ocean of conformance. The myth was, you're acting like boys. The truth was, we are being true to our nature, not acting at all. As far as we were concerned, it was our girlfriends who seemed to have suddenly lost their minds over the summer. What kind of strange virus had they contracted to make them erase their eyebrows and talk gibberish to boys and stuff their bras and underwear with paper to make their boobs and butts bigger? Is that not madness? For sure, we had our share of casualties. It usually happened over a break or a holiday when one of us would come back changed. Did you see Connie? She's wearing makeup. She looks so different. We didn't know that junior high was the last place on earth to be an individual and probably didn't realize how much hurt feelings mattered or how scared our parents become when we fail to evolve in predictable ways. We were scared ourselves. Our numbers dwindled and somehow our fires never burned quite so brightly. One might wonder what it might have been like without the pressure, the name calling, the disapproving stares. If we had not lived in so much inner isolation, but it had been allowed to act and be as powerful as we felt, I can't imagine. To have run the distance of our desires and explorations and not renege on our glories or sell short our natural intelligence. If from the moment we left the gate, we had family and friends cheering us to finish proud and to finish strong, a hooray for the tomboy daughters who, had lit, who would have lit the track of their lives, lives of fire. So um, anyway, <laughs> so that's writing stuff. Any comments so far? Do you want to uh, share your song? Oh, right. Um, okay, so uh, yeah. Um, Desiree did a wonderful job talking a lot about the, the musical um, me, the, all these other parts of myself that I um, use to uh, express myself and to survive. Um, uh, my musical, uh, you know, when you, when, uh, by the time I, uh, started to teach myself to play music, it was a lot in response to the fact that the parents that had raised me, my grandmother and my grandfather, had both passed away within a few months of each other. 
And uh, I don't remember grieving at the time. I just remember becoming completely engrossed in music and writing music. Um, and uh, and I had um, moved to another community that was uh, so different from the community I'd grown up in. I'd moved into a white community and I was one, I think I was the only Hispanic girl there. So um, kids would always come up to me and say, what are you? <laughs> you know, uh, and I'd be embarrassed naturally, I wouldn't really say. So one thing I did that I actually started doing in junior high because I was feeling threatened uh, to be beat up because I was a bit of a wimp, um, is that I started to sing, uh, I volunteered to sing. I volunteered to sing Tom Dooley in the second grade, go figure. And then uh, during lunch in junior high, I would sing some of the, the popular R&B songs of the time. And I noticed that people liked it. They liked hearing me sing, they liked the songs and they would say, oh, sing this one or do you know this song? And uh, so that encouraged me a lot to, to, to be a singer uh, and, um, and then later to teach myself guitar. In terms of, so one of, I mentioned to, uh, is it Cameron? Mm -hmm. I mentioned to Cameron that one of the early songs that I'd written, um, this was when I started to go to this white school, a uh, school um, uh, where I felt really, really out of place. And, and I, and this was a place where it was like surfers and blondes and here I am, you know, not a surfer, not blonde. And, uh, and I was missing some of the R and B that I'd been growing up listening to the oldies and all that. And, uh, so I was writing a rock song and I came and I thought, well, you know, people here need some soul. <laughs> So I wrote a sign that went a little bit like this. It's just first lyrics, killer. Let's have a little bit of soul, yeah. Come on and dig it, yeah, yeah. Repeat. See how subversive that is? Music is so revolutionary. I used the rock song and I talked about soul, which, you know, you didn't really hear about in, um, in, in uh, Orange County, but, Fortunately, I evolved a little bit after that, uh, but I was uh, doing a lot of uh, rock band stuff back then. That was my dream, to be uh, a lead guitar player in, in a rock band. But then, um, as a teenager, I heard um, and saw Buffy St. Marie for the first time in my life and, and heard her sing, My Country, Tis of Thy People, You Are Dying. And I had never in my life heard anybody tell the story of the genocide of Native folks in this country. There's so much we don't hear and we don't, even if it's part of our story, even if we ourselves have been if Mexicans or were colonialized as well and, and uh, forced to um, give up a lot of our traditions and and lose a lot of our sense of, of our own identity and have it be replaced with um, this other, uh, the colonizing culture of the time. And so when she talked about about history, she talked about that, that the history books were rewritten. And that really struck me that we weren't being told the truth about what was really going on and the suffering that was going on. That it, that, um, so um, I started to write, song. I, I played in a lot of different types of musicals, played a lot of different musical styles, but around the early 70s, I got woke. <laughs> I got politicized. I started to read a lot of books that um, uh, encouraged me to uh, to uh, use my voice 
to address some of these issues. Like uh, 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 I did a lot of, um, we did a lot of benefit concerts back then for United Farm Workers and for uh, the women's movement, of course, and uh, gay liberation movement, because back then it was still just barely a liberation movement. Anyway, I was also very drawn to writing about um, I was concerned about the environment, and in um, mid-70s, I took a trip to Mexico for the first time in a 1957 Chevy panel truck with uh, my uh, partner and musician friend Kristen and a another couple who joined us. They were in a Volvo, um, and we went to Oaxaca, and... Kristen had known a couple of women who uh, had rented or bought a hacienda out there and um, and they were exploiting the local uh, uh, kids, young people, to clean their house and to cook for them and and you know I just didn't I didn't want to even stay there. I did not want to be uh, served by my own people. It just did not feel right. So I took a walk and I wandered off into a field and uh, I was laying in the field and I, I just, these thoughts and feelings came over me and uh, a woman came by uh, who was coming back from washing her clothes in a creek and she had a big basket of clothes and so I offered to help her and she took me to her little hut which uh, was a dirt floor with a little fire pit extreme poverty and she had explained that her daughters were working at the hacienda and not getting paid and being ripped off by these people so from that experience I wrote a song that was called Million Eyed Woman and I'd like to share that with you I'm gonna sing it a cappella, and my voice might crack so I'm gonna take a little sip of water I asked my friend Isetta, who's played music with me since our 20s, if she could rush over here and sing the chorus with me, but unfortunately at 7 o'clock she's ready to watch her Netflix stuff. So anyway, thanks Isetta. Thought, it's the thought that counts. This is called Million Eyed Woman. And it was on a quiet morning that I was weary and empty from energy wasted on trying. There alone in a field of white flowers Wet from the morning, bright in the sun, I lay my head and cried in the soft sweet earth. And I cried till I slept and soon wept as I slept and it was for the million I woman whose life has been laid down by gun, who's laid down her life, giver of life, whose life has been taken from her and her ages of children. Run with I am oops, sorry. And then I heard a million voices. There was peace. They sang invisibly. Only I knew they were there. Only I knew they were there. 
And they said, follow and bring your sisters to stop all this raping, to stop this crazy man who's killing me, my body. Who's killing me, my soul? My spirit is saddened for the wings of the air, swimmers of seas, four footed and fleet, the deer and the bears. For once she's gone, we won't come here again. And the garden will perish. Hunger is so near, once she is gone. Once she is gone. We won't come here again. No, no. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. I do have another written piece, but um, yeah. What, shall I do that? Yeah. Now? Okay. I think you should absolutely share. Okay, so just one more little piece. One more homage. See all these cool English words I learned? I learned really good in school. No. <laughs> the schools were lousy. Oh my God. Califas. California is an epic poem with, un, with beautiful unwritten verses and a vivid plagiarized past. The Spaniard, the Anglo rancher, the miners, the speculators have all bit into her flesh and few have used her wisely. Like those little tarnished bells hanging on hook staffs that mark the incision of the Camino Real, she is a favorite among vandals. All too many have been heart blind not to see that she holds the fruit of her bounty in tender hands and heals all lack from love deeper than, ocean, than the ocean's border. We do not want for food nor beauty in her presence because everything grows here. Every color emerges from her garden. The crimson pomegranate, the yellow loquates, tear-shaped avocados, fragrant limones, sunburned apricots, blue-beaked birds of paradise, passion flowers, and oliveras. She was a blessed oasis ceaselessly inspired to create. Califas, you are a dream that awakened me to my earthy self. Calif California, la Mexicana, mother of all mestizos, used to cup our pajarito varios to your breasts where they tangled with your long black India hair. Your land became a refuge for our bastard race. It comforted the people who felt severed heart and soul from our sister spirit, Mexico. The maguey, the nopalitos, once lined our streets like ancient dreams when Califas was Atzlan. Between the tentacle spikes and thorny green mirrors, the barrio took shape. A scatter of migrant shanties and marshmallow cottages squatted in a pauper's paradise. Here there would be a little garden for growing chilies or tomates, maybe, maybe some chickens for eggs. To my child self, you were a generous benefactress, feeding my hungry tooth as I went a pass through trees that dropped white peaches, walnuts, persimmons, and figs. I would lie on your dusty chest and was, watch your colors blend into mine. We are coffee cream with little flecks like hardened sunlight and bronze in the summer. The hard but truthful gleam of your golden califlora eyes. A story I heard tells how Califas had agreed the sun that the summers would be long. 
It was a trade for the miracles below. So as agreed, the sun climbed slowly as if in a trance until the weight of its intensity could no longer hold. And just when the humans below could no longer take one more degree of glory, Khalifas would take the sun down like an artist putting away her paints, leaving the pleasure of her work to melt down the canvas of a bleached out sky. It was while her mestizo children slept that she planted dreams of immortality and unquestionable possibilities. That way, when they wakened, they would have an insatiable urge to work in her gardens, clawing at her thighs, planting her seeds. By afternoon, they would be all but blinded from helping her give birth under the scrutiny of white heat. Finally, in the evening, the tired farmers, sowers of seeds, sat still to witness from their patios the clamor of their children, raising the pale orange dust that drifted hastily, hazily at the edge of the horizon, acting as if again, acting again as if acting on a hunch. We would all gather ritually for the sun's fiery death while in one breathless moment, Khalifa, so beautiful to the eye, coyly disappeared like the goddess that she is. Her brown-skinned children succumb to the heat, which falls like a heavy blanket. Simple mortals, servants to Khalifas, who wrestle weakly against their fate, sipping in and out of honeysuckle dreams, while a voice whispers, ever so delicately, I will be back. I have to clap. I have to clap. I just can't help it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, Naomi. That was absolutely beautiful. I have um, a ton of questions. I have a ton of questions. I want to make sure that we're uh, getting students' questions first. Thank you, Cameron. Um, so Anthony Mondragon, wants to know Mondragon. yes he says i wanted to try writing musical lyrics at some point where is a good place to start in order to create a meaningful song that is more than just words that sound good together wow that is a tricky question uh so you want to create music do you play guitar <laughs> if you don't that'd be a good start Singing a cappella is one way. I think, I think the idea is when, just like writing, you have to get in the zone. You have to totally feel something percolating and then be willing to make time to be by yourself with no distractions to really just work it. it because it's a lot of experimentation. It's, um, I use piano. I was, I'm a self-taught musician, so um, a keyboard is a really good start. You can get a cheap keyboard for 99 bucks. Uh, and, and then you can pluck out melodies on that. And it's, it's really, you got to trust your intuition because if you're feeling that music is something within you, it's going to come out. It's just a matter of not judging yourself and letting it just flow. Um, I used to have a weird, weird idiosyncratic habit about writing a song that once I wrote the song, I couldn't change the lyrics because then it wouldn't be pure anymore. You don't have to do that. You can just, I would just say to experiment, uh, to find an instrument or use your voice and uh, record yourself so you can hear yourself. Because sometimes when you're hearing the music back, it might inspire you to sing along even some more. I hope that helps. That's um really, really good advice. And I know uh, Anthony also, Anthony, I'll just shout you out. I know you're one who likes to write something um, and, and kind of maintain it in that moment of inspiration. Uh, so that's really yeah. a good point. And I love too how you said like uh, just practice singing out loud, hear yourself yeah. say it and record yourself and yeah. see what. Um, don't don't judge you. what you're doing. Just do it. <laughs> you know, because uh, Take a feeling, whatever it is that you're feeling, whether you're feeling sad about something or happy about something, or you've been thinking about something, make it a game in some ways, you know. Um, it just 
but don't be don't judge yourself just just trust yourself because that's that's i think that's the key i think so many creative people they procrastinate <laughs> and getting beyond procrastination is, is really really hard so you have to give yourself a reason to why you would want this maybe say okay i'm going to write this and i'm going to share this with this person or it's just going to be for myself i love that um and then Rhett wants to know and i was going to ask you this too um he says i'd love to hear the significance of the name little bear and who um gave you your name or where it came from the significance of little bear came in um out of um well, it was in the 70s. Well, first of all, I have had, uh, when you're Mexican, you grow up with a nickname and use that nickname for as long as you can around your family members. And some of my family members still call me that nickname. And I actually didn't know that my first name was actually Patricia. And obviously I'm not a Patricia, but then I didn't always really feel like I was a Naomi other either and um and then when i was um uh going to high school my friends called me patty and i did it wasn't until they attached the term crazy patty then then it made sense to me that was a term of endearment for my hippie friends but little bear came as a um uh as an inspiration of 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 just I have a, a deep love of nature and and uh, and somebody just nicknamed me that somebody just called me little bear uh, I think it had to do with my stature and because at that point I didn't really have a name that I really could really hold on to this is what happens when you when you're kind of parent yourself too is that you start to I mean I have other names too believe me uh, but little bear really stuck as, and then I read the significance of, of bears being very um, maternal. And I am a very maternal person. It doesn't seem like it would be, but uh, I, I am. I have, and I can't think of any one uh, creature that has such a strong maternal instinct than, than a bear and a lion. So it's either a little bear or a little lion. But uh, so little bear stuck. Um, and it, it is something that I, uh, I don't like to use the term, uh, spirit animal. Uh, it can sound a little pretentious, but, um, it, it, it's, it's certainly something that feels like it, it, it fits me, um, in my most playful part of my being. Thank you. And I think, um, this is related to, right? Like you, you talk about writing as survival. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know like in, in writing workshops and stuff, there's this sense of, uh, privilege of like, let's go on a retreat and <laughs> like, um, you know, conjure inspiration or something, but you talk about writing and survival. And I think what you just said about your name, I know that other people have tried to put names on you, um, and things like that. So I was hoping you could speak to writing as a, as a means of survival and your relationship with music in particular. Um, could you rephrase that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, like why why do you write what does it mean for you to write what does it mean for you to make music and what's at stake if you were to not do that well i don't think there was ever a question that that i i wouldn't do it i mean it was just it was just a natural thing for me you know i i i grew up with hearing 45 records the chantelles and 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 oh great harmonies i fell in love with harmonies and I learned to harmonize by listening to these amazing singers of those times. I think loneliness and isolation and indivisible and and be and feeling invisible and sort of, you know, not paid attention to. You know, my grandmother was a very um, uh, old school uh, uh, person. She fed and clothed and disciplined me. But there wasn't uh, really much affection. Well, no affection. <laughs> okay. So I, I was left alone a lot. I, I spent, uh, and because there was so much chaos growing up when, with me and my cousins, people moving in and out, there was um, 
we had uh, relatives that became addicted to heroin and, and uh, would, or others that would be incarcerated. So the, the adults were, were, were out of control. But on Friday nights, there was music, you know, there'd be music. There's always be some kind of music going on. And uh, my, one of my uncles played guitar and I remember seeing my uncle Gilbert playing his electric guitar. And it's just, it was just meant to be for me. It was my fate. You know, I saw an electric, I saw a guitar when I was uh, uh, in um, maybe about six years old and I begged my grandmother to buy it for me. And we were poor, we, so there was no way, but you know, I guess I gave her enough of a hard time that she put it on layaway because I wouldn't give up. And, um, and I think she recognized my musicality, but she didn't really um, encourage it. So it was just something that I did in, uh, to, to deal with my loneliness and to deal with my, to also, I guess, prove myself. I wanted to prove that, that I could make a difference. So that's where I guess the, you grow because then you, the thing that music does too, is that informs you. Uh, later on, when, when I read some of my lyrics, and I thought, oh, I wrote that for somebody else, but then I look at it, and no, I wrote that for myself. I just didn't realize it at the time. So musicians are just gonna be musicians no matter what. No, you know, that's just, they're bent. And in terms of, of um, like in uh, and the writing bit, you know, I. Well, it's also about attention. You know, boy, you get all sorts of attention when you suddenly do something as crazy as, as decide to sing in front of your class, you know, a cappella. Uh, one of the hardest songs I sang was uh, Mary Wells' You Beat Me to the Punch. Oh my gosh, that is a really hard song to sing a cappella, but I did it because I just felt the urge to do it. And maybe I just, felt that this is the one thing that gives me a sense of you're okay. You're not just this queer, weird, homely looking kid, poor kid, you know, you know, we were really poor. So I got picked on and bullied a lot. So uh, in grade school, so it was, uh, it was survival. Plain and simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I know that your song "Can't Kill the Spirit," which you wrote decades ago. I know you've shared with me that, like, you know, monthly, if not weekly, people are reaching out to you right. to, to revisit the song and wanting to use the song. Yeah. And so for you, like, you know, in terms, like, the song is called "Can't Kill the Spirit," and like, the song won't die. You know, like, <laughs> so, so, what do you see as the significance of that piece in particular? And I know you're revisiting other songs too, and you're finding this like relevance. Well, the, the story behind You Can't Kill the Spirit is because really uh, I wanted to say that, that what's important for me is to want to inspire other um, people of color, especially um, uh, Mexican Americans who kind of live in the shadows of being bound to certain traditions, especially for young women where they're really not supposed to express themselves. Uh, very boldly, you know, it's all about, you know, the good, the good Catholic girl, the good demure Catholic girl. You know, there's the wild pachucas, but see, I, I didn't quite, I wasn't that wild, but I wasn't that mild. So I was somewhere in between. And in that in between space, um, I wanted to be a, a musician. I wanted to play music and uh, but you always need somebody else, usually a white person, to help you get there. So I, um, I, I think the, my, my music became uh, accessible to, to everyone simply because I was playing in a band with, with white women who I feel like um, gave me some sort of um, pass into this world. Uh, it, it was during the 70s, women's music was really big, but at the same time there was a lot of manipulations as to, well, you should write about this, you should write about that, or you're too angry, you're not angry enough, or, you know, there's just a lot of, like, stuff that inhibits you, uh, that can inhibit you when you uh, hold on to that white passport to try to get you to, the doors open for you. 
Um, and one of those uh, doors that we were trying to get open for ourselves was um, we contacted a, a feminist music company of the day at that time. Uh, and um, they turned us down because they were looking for a salsa band. And uh, which is ridiculous because I, I, I really didn't grow up with salsa music. I grew up with rancheras and I would have loved to have done rancheras, but that's not what we did in the day. So I came home after that, that, that very depressing uh, conversation and experience. And I sat down at the piano and I wrote, you can't kill the spirit because I really did feel that I had something that I wanted to say but it was being pushed back. And I thought, well, you know what? Even if it's being pushed back, it's gonna come up. It's gonna keep coming up. Uh, because the truth always wins out. And, and it's a universal truth that you really can't hold down the spirit of a people. And, and I think that's what people are, are uh, in various parts of the globe, you know, uh, 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 found with that song and that's why Besides using it in political movements and anti-war movements, it was also used in, for uh, people have sung it at funerals, at, at, uh, at, um, in Greece, at the Temple of Athena. You know, it just, it, it, somehow it reached them. I have no idea why or how, but um, it, it doesn't matter. But what, what, what speaks to, but the, the part, but ironically, because of racism, I feel like I was never able to reach a commercial, any kind of commercial success, i.e. make any money off the music. So, uh, you know, at, at 40, I, 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 after I finished writing a, a lesbian rock opera and doing other events, I just thought I need to get a real job and that, that's going to pay me some money because everybody else had gone off to their college jobs and I needed to get work. So. Um, uh, I hope that's not going to be the case because I'm getting kind of tired of only seeing the beloved Rita Moreno at the Oscars. I'd like to see some Mexican-American people there. I'd like to see more representation. And here we are at 2022 and already we know we're being threatened to be silenced yet more and again. Double lock. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing that. That's um, just... I can't like I can't I can't even imagine um, wasting that much potential. And I know it's because I was here the other day and we were talking about wasted potential. Right. And I know when um, you know you know people like walk around and they see poverty or they see um, children kind of running around without parents, they don't see it that way. And yet when you when you look at that, you see wasted potential. I do. And so I was hoping I you do. could talk about that. Yeah, yeah. We talk about purpose. Um, um, I think I. I'm a little piece of it. Oh well. Anyway, I'm going to see if I can remember my thoughts on this. Um, it's easy to, to lose our sense of purpose or that we have a sense of purpose. And for people of color, I think part of that um, inability to express your, your true life's purpose and your potential is partly we're we're fighting the obstacles and the barriers, the real obstacles and the barriers that exist via discrimination. And the other part that we're fighting that's a lot harder is what's inside, our, our own internalized, uh, what we've internalized as the negative stereotypes of our particular race. And, and that because of that, we are more prone to self-sabotage our, our successes because it's, it's, um, we're crossing into a realm and into a territory of realness that um, is, um, it's, it's an uncharted territory for a lot of people. And, and then poverty, of course, keeps people from being able to, to reach their potential. But I, I do believe it's possible because um, I think if you have that drive and if there are, I think this is where allies can come in as long as that they don't manipulate and, and overmanage your uh, creativity is 
that allies can be very useful for helping open those doors that are closed because there are still too many people out there that won't open those doors for you. Um, I mean, it would be great that we could just get there just by virtue of our own hard work. But we know that there are hardworking musicians, creatives, artists, uh, brilliant minds out there that aren't getting the chance to have the benefit of giving the gift of their, of their own brilliance because they are being put in little boxes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That was really beautifully said. We have uh, one more question and then everyone wants to know if you can kill, can't sing, can't kill the spirit. If you can sing, can't kill the spirit. Ah. <laughs> Would you be willing to? Uh, okay. Um, okay, let me ask this question and then we can get into the song. Margaret Jones wants to know, how are you surviving in this time and do you plan on speaking about it or how we can all move forward together? Oh my gosh. How are we, how am I, how are we surviving? Well, these are really scary times um, and it's, it's very edgy, you know. Um, at my age, I feel like I don't know what, what else I can do uh, other than to encourage uh, the younger generations to explore their own internal mythologies that work against them and that also work against other people that are potential allies. Uh, we have to be able to um, open our hearts and minds and trust that um, that there is some benefit there because it's one thing to uh, to patronize the arts of people of color but you got to do more than that there has to be some more action you have to help the communities from where they come from uh, so that we can I, so that we can look at the at the poverty and help raise people out of poverty raise people out of out of um, these abusive places where they've they've lost their way or they've been neglected somehow, we've got to be helpers basically, and um, I guess in some way I see that the the people of Ukraine are great examples of how we can be, and that is that we lift one another up. We don't leave anybody behind, and we. Um, because these are dangerous times. We could lose this. We could lose all this freedom. We really could. And I, that frightens me. But um, I, I, I just have a lot of faith that the younger generation isn't allowed to do that. They're not going to allow these books to be banned. They're going to they're gonna read those books. They're going to learn from those books. But for my white allies, I just want to encourage you to just, not to just patronize, but to actually help in action with action go into those communities and find out what that community needs in in um, practical terms you know if you have musical instruments at home that you don't use donate them give them to kids that need them i wanted a guitar so bad and my first guitar was held together with scotch tape and we need that there's there's so many things that we need thank you okay you want to sing the song oh right Got to get the key. I'll be right back. Well, I'm probably going to have to use the, my songbook. Who did it? I don't know my songs. By all means, do it before you lose your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can push back an ocean. It's going to rise back up in waves. And nobody 
can stop the wind from blowing, can stop a mind from growing. Somebody may stop my voice from singing, but the song will live on and on. You can't kill the spirit. It's like a mountain. Old and strong, she lives on and on. Nobody can stop. Oh boy. Uh, a woman from feeling. She has to rise up like the sun. Somebody may change the words we're saying. But the truth will live on and on. You can't kill the spirit. She's like a mountain. Old and strong. She lives on and on. You can't kill the spirit. She's like a mountain. Old and strong. She lives on and on. Woo! Thank you so much, Naomi. That was um, an incredible reading. This is all we have for you tonight, folks. Thank you so much Goodbye. for tuning in. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you for so listening. Much, Naomi. It was an Keep honor writing. You. Don't give up. <laughs> Can't kill the spirit. Can't kill the spigot. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.